Now, I want to remind you guys, if you, weren't, if you weren't here last week or you didn't go in on the mission, our brother David here, he was captured by the enemy, by the PR. But we intercepted, we intercepted a drop. And so we couldn't let our brother keep suffering. So some brave men and women went out to rescue our brother. And they were successful. He's here tonight. So he's going he's gonna to tell us a little bit about his story, but he's really going to bring the word of God and, and, just, and just bring us a good word. So we're excited. All right. So how is everybody tonight? Okay. You know, it's, it's good to be back with my family and the people that won't hit me in the face for no reason. Um, yeah. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of the history. If you guys weren't here weeks before, um, they, there's a lot of people that sent in a mass of transmissions to us to come and try and save them, to bring them to the pillar. And on one particular transmission, my brother Tyler and I went out and uh, just to see if we could find anybody, see if we can get the right coordinates. And we came to this location that looked like an old junkyard at something, but we saw this girl sitting on a bunch of crates, and I decided to go check it out and see if it was safe. She, uh, she didn't say anything when I approached her, and as I got closer, I noticed that men ran out, tackled me, and took me away. Um... I don't know where they took me. I don't know how many days I was gone. Uh, I know for the first few days, I think, I, I couldn't tell time, but they, uh, they denied me food and water, and they beat me pretty bad. And they really just broke my spirit down and then left me alone for a few days just to sit. And after some time, there was a, a man that walked in and just started talking to me. He just started saying things like, you know, we don't really care that you read the Bible, but you should just kind of keep it to yourself. We don't want anybody getting all crazy. We don't get anybody getting excited about it and causing some kind of uproar. So we, it's okay, but just, just kind of keep it personal. Don't share it with anybody. And we've told this to other other people with other books. So... Just don't, don't cause any trouble. And he started to use the word against me. He started to quote scripture at me, and he just changed some things. But it got me thinking, <laughs> was, was this all real, and was it worth it? Did I really need to be so excited about God? Was the pillar going to succeed? And I just, I couldn't take it. I was almost gone. I almost decided to give up and just just walk away from it. But then I had a verse that was going on and on in my head. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And that phrase kept repeating in my head. And I, I began to think again. Just trust in the Lord. And the Bible is... God's words to us. Who, who's this guy that's coming in and trying to convince me otherwise? You know, after all they'd done, I realized that it was worth suffering for. And I had to hold true to what the Bible said. I had to hold true to what God was telling me in my heart. And I remembered a phrase that Mikey had told us several weeks back, solo scriptura. For those of you guys who weren't here, that means only the text, which means that we take our truth from the Bible and not from an outside source. So before I keep going, I'm going to have a little interactive piece with you guys. Everybody on this side is going to be the learn section. You guys are going to say learn. Everybody in the back over there, you're going to be two. Everybody over here on the right, you're going to be the discern section. So you got to be on your toes. So when I point at you, you got to say your word, all right? Okay. Good. <laughs> what does discern mean? 
in this sense, I'm talking about discerning between good and evil, what God says and what something says that doesn't sound totally correct. So, I need the Bible real quick. I need God's Word. I'm taking some stuff from 1 Timothy chapter 4, the first section. There's a lot in this chapter, but I'm going to focus on just the beginning section here. So if you have your Bibles, please follow along. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciousness have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know in the truth. For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, because it is consecrated by the word of God in prayer. If you point these things out to brothers and sisters, you'll be a good minister of Jesus Christ, brought up in the truth of the faith and the good teaching that, is, that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales, Rather, train yourself to be godly, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. <clears throat> so even within that section, there's a lot to digest and think about. <clears throat> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break it down a little bit, piece by piece. And it starts off by saying some will depart. If you guys remember from uh, Brandon's teaching... Alexander and Hymenaeus. Who remembers a little bit about them? Shipwreck. Does that ring any bells at all? <coughs> Come on. What's that? <laughs> okay. All right. So it said that their faith was shipwrecked. And that means what the text says. Their faith crashed for whatever reason. Paul doesn't want us to focus on what the reason was, if they're going to go to heaven or hell or not. But he's saying that something caused them to veer off course. What was that? Next it says doctrines of demons. It will forbid us to marry and force us to abstain from foods. I don't know about you guys, but I enjoy myself at a cheese fried rat pretty well. You know, that dairy and meat, that's what's up. <coughs> yeah. We don't have cows anymore, so I can't have a bacon cheeseburger. But yeah. It's a, it's a cow. Awesome. Yep. So, Paul goes on to explain that we can avoid some deception. We can avoid falling into deception by training ourselves in godliness. And what that means is that we are going to cling to God's word and what the text says, and therefore we'll be an example to others. So, we need to know the truth from the truth, which the truth from the Bible. And we need to be nursed in the Word. Just as food nourishes our bodies, the Bible's going to nourish our souls, right? That's right. So if you go without eating, you're going to shrivel up and die. If you go without reading your Bible, you're going to shrivel up and die inside. Isn't that fun? <laughs> so. All right, okay. <laughs> Trying to keep you guys awake. Okay. So, again, that means to tell the difference between good and evil. What, what we think God says and what we know God says versus what seems kind of off. So I'm going to zoom out a second. And I'm going to talk about what, why God wants us to read his word. Does anybody have any, any idea why he wants us to read the word? Truth, grow. Sword, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to talk. I don't want to say anything to anybody. What? Come on. <laughs> okay. All those things. There you go. Okay. So all those things help us to cling to God, and they give us a direct connection to him. There's something that's super awesome that when you physically open your Bible, there's a direct connection of communication between you and God that you can't get anywhere else through worship, through talking with Christian brothers and sisters, there's just something amazing about opening the Bible. And if you guys have ever seen the movie Hocus Pocus, it's like when they open the book and it, poosh, that's what I think of. There's a giant beam of light going to heaven, right? So,
And that's going to help us keep, be ready, in season, out of season. Mm. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, clinging to God's word is going to help keep us from falling into deception. It's going to help us stay true to what God has called us to do. And I've got a story for you guys about a part, uh, a time when I was deceived. And before, when I was in captivity, um, growing up, I, I found that I thought I should be the right hand of God. I was reading the Bible. I was getting into my faith pretty deep. And I decided that, you know what? I'm going to show people Christ by beating the crap out of them. I had the mindset that I was going to get with some of my super Christian friends, with my super Christian self, and go to parties, dressed up in masks and all kinds of weird get up, and go run through the party beating people up because they were sinning, they were drinking and all that fun stuff. Does that sound like it's a good idea? No. <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> there's, a, there's a very big line there. So... My, my parents pulled me aside, pulled me into our tent, and um, they said, you know what, you, you, kinda, you need to slow down. You're being very self-righteous. And I was thinking to myself, I'm like, you of all people should know that what they're doing is wrong, and I've got the right to tell them what they're doing wrong, and I can show them Jesus by giving them a black eye. So, totally wrong. I was deceived in my heart, so much so that I thought I was right. It had gone so far that I wouldn't listen to anybody else. So it can even happen to a diaconos. It can happen to Mikey. It can happen to Cole. It can happen to Macy. No one is exempt from deception. It shows no favorites. And there's just something about it. Deception is so good. It, it just goes so deep sometimes. And again, I was almost deceived when I was taken into the PR's uh, captivity. So who remembers? I've got another story from Reagan's sermon. There was a guy who was uh, from a, a different country, and he started off in the military, and he saw there's a whole bunch of problems with his country, his economic problems, class distinctions that were going off the wall, and certain ethnic groups that just needed to go. So he took it in his own hands to eradicate all of the Jews from Germany. Yeah, Adolf Hitler. See, I bet he was a really intelligent guy, and I bet he thought and knew in his heart that he was right. But from an outside perspective, we can see that killing lots of people is probably not the best idea, right? Right? Okay. So how does deception start? Sometimes it starts by people twisting the word for their own personal gain. So they can get things done to get them power or money or control over people. Sometimes it's pride. Sometimes we get a big head. And we let, us, let ourselves think that, you know, I can do this on my own. I can show everybody who's right and who's wrong. And we get going way off course towards shipwreck. So, like what the man did to me when I was captured... We put just enough truth in it to make it justified for us, to make it seem okay and make it comfortable. But we can't do that. There's a verse in the Bible that talks about Satan being the father of lies. And I don't know about you, but I think he's pretty good at it. He's been at it for, you know, maybe 60,000 plus years. So he's got some experience under his belt. And the verse is John 8:44. Jesus is talking to scribes and uh, Pharisees. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks in his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So, I want you guys to ask your... <laughs> yeah. We don't need a fire in here. We need a spiritual fire, not a literal fire. So <laughs> yep. So I want you guys to ask yourself a question real quick. 
can it happen to me? Yeah. You say that now. You say yes now because you're in church, right? Mmm. There we go. Fire's hot. Okay. But when you're alone in your room and you've just got over a fight with somebody, you think, no, I'm, I'm totally right. I can't be wrong. I know this. Can you be deceived? Can you do it? Yeah. So it can happen to anyone. It can happen to anyone, anytime. So... Okay. Chase, tell me what discerned means again real quick. <laughs> that we need to <laughs> evaluate the body for yourself. Tell the difference between good and evil. There you go. Gotcha. Gotcha. <clears throat> So there's a second question I guys want you to ask yourselves. Can I overcome deception? Yes. Notice I didn't say defeat deception. I didn't say beat deception. I didn't say not have to deal with it. I said, can you overcome it? Can you recognize when deception staring you in the face and turn to God's path? Using the model given by uh, Paul in 1 Timothy and Jesus, yes. Paul sets it up for us. We have to be nourished in the Word, and we have to exercise, exercise ourselves towards godliness. That doesn't mean get down and do you know push-up jacks until we feel holy. It's not what it means. It means challenging ourselves in the Word, going deeper than we want to a lot of times. Just, all right, I read the Bible, John 3.16. No. What does John 3.16 break down and mean? What does 1 Timothy break down and mean? You have to go a lot deeper than you want to a lot of times. And you get something out of it. Jesus was even tempted by Satan. He was on the road to being deceived. You know, he's standing up there on the mountain. And Satan says, I'll give you all this. I'll give you all the kingdoms. Everything you want. All the glory. If you just bow down to me. Jesus said, no. It's already mine. Why was it his already? Because he was rooted, he, yeah, well, he was God, yeah, that's, yes. <laughs> he was rooted in the Word. The Bible says he even was the Word. So he is the living flesh Word. It's all up here, and he could quote Scripture like that. He quoted Scripture back at the devil, because he knew it. He believed it. He was it. So, I've got another verse for you guys, and this this is something I found is really awesome. Because when you overcome deception, you'll, you'll feel this, and it's pretty cool. And Isaiah 32, 1 through 2 says, See, you will reign in righteousness, and man shall rule with justice. Each one will, will be like a shelter from the wind and a refuge from the storm. Do you guys have this in your Bible? Are you, are you reading it with me? Are you looking at the screen? Screen? Open it up. I'll give you some time to open it up. Isaiah 32, 1 through 2. See, you will reign in righteousness, and man shall rule with justice. Each one will be like a shelter from the wind and a refuge from the storm, the streams of water in the desert, and the shadow of the great rock in a thirsty land. Anybody catch that? Anybody paying attention? Someone, someone read it to me from the Bible. Watch. Come up here. Come here so we can get everybody in here. There we go. All right. See, a king will reign in righteousness, and rulers rule, rule with justice. Each man will be like a shelter from the wind and a refuge from the storm, like streams of water in the desert and the shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land. Did you catch that? I changed two words. I changed two words to you and man. Oh, crap. There it goes. <laughs> so, that's, that's me lying to you guys. That's not good. 
you've been decepted. <laughs> so I've, I heard a story from uh, a friend that I met, uh, I guess, last summer. She was telling me how she went to her friend's church, and they are having a guest speaker come in. And she never heard of this guy before, first time going to that church. And he started quoting scripture, put it up on the board and everything, and she looked through her Bible. Those verses didn't exist. Now, I'm not saying that he was doing this to deceive them, but maybe that's because it, he thought that's what God wanted to emphasize his point, to make it clear to the congregation. So he was deceived into thinking he should make up his own scripture to make it seem better. And that causes a lot of problems because that will go f as far as getting people to think what he wanted them to think. He inceptioned them. He inceptioned them into deception. Oh, snap. Okay, still awake? You still going? It's just Tuesday. Come on. Yep. <laughs> All right. So intelligent people can be deceived also. People who are scholars, people who are the head of church organizations, anybody. Again, no one is exempt from deception. And scholars have had arguments and have different conclusions over things that are important, that are huge. Are we once saved, always saved? Or are we not? I'm not arguing for one over the other. That's not the point. I'm trying to display that someone is right in that instance and someone is not. Someone is deceived. I'm not taking a side. I'm not doing anything but to show you that this can happen to anybody. Is there such a thing as predestination? Or do we have absolute free will? Can we achieve holiness? Or are we all just going to remain sinners forever? Is flesh good or evil natured? That's a good one. One is right, one is wrong. And around Paul's time, there was a group called the Gnostics. And the root for the word Gnostics, Nosco, is know or knowledge. And through research and through reading the Bible, reading other people's texts and opinions, they formed their own doctrine. And this wasn't just some overnight thing. This wasn't something that wasn't, was underdeveloped. This was thought through and intelligent and deep. And they ultimately believed that all matter was evil and only the spirit was good. So the chair that Brandon Upton is sitting in is evil. It wants him. It's going to take him down. That doesn't make any sense to us. But they're intelligent people, and they're still around. So... Paul wants us to recognize that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And for the Gnostics, that wasn't good enough. They had to seek for something else. They had to seek for something outside of God to achieve salvation, which was knowledge. Does that sound right to you guys at all? Okay. Cool. Because <clears throat> it's not. But don't, don't believe it just because I say it. Believe it because it's in your Bible. Yep. So, anyone can be deceived. Anyone can be right. Anyone can be wrong. <coughs> okay. So, if there's anything that you guys are going to get out of this, if there's anything you write down, if there's anything you key into your iPhone into your notes. Please get these three things. Number one is be open to the idea that you could be wrong. Be open to the idea that you could be wrong. I'm not saying that you should live in doubt and walk around just, I have to, no, no, I can't do, and you shouldn't, you shouldn't also live in a way where you're like, 
you know, okay, that's yeah, this way is, this way's good. This way's good. I like this. And oh, that's good too. So I'm going to jump to this conclusion also. That's not good. Be open to the idea that you can be deceived, which means you have to find a balance, which is difficult to do. You have to be willing to take in God's word and observe the outside. Number two. Oh, excuse me. Hold on. Everybody's got that one person that they know who is always right. Always right. Well, this is, this is correct because I say so, and you can't say anything about it. Period. Okay? And then in your mind, you're like, you're just so dumb. just want to stupid punch you in the gut. Oh. And then even when they are right on those rare occasions, then um, you just want to disagree with them because you can. Even, <laughs> even though you know that they're right, just, God, ugh, I can't deal with it. Ugh. Everybody has that person. <laughs> Number two is ask godly counsel. Yeah. Godly counsel consists of those people who have your best interest in heart. Not for their gain. So oh, I've got this many people coming to me, so I'm important. No. They're concerned with where your life is going. And those are people that are further than you in the faith, that you know seek God's word daily, that are in God's presence all the time. And, you know, there's times when you have that friend come up to you and they say, man, this, this guy, just I can't believe what he said to me the other day. And he's just going to, you know, he's going to be wrong about everything. And he offended me and everything like that. He offended me and I'm not going to be friends with him anymore. Where's your mind go to about the person they're talking about? You don't like him that much, do you? Even if it's another one of your friends, right? So, in, you know, you could go to them and get the other side of the story, right? Which would be the wise thing to do. And instead of being forced into one mindset about them, you can discover the whole story and then you're given three options. You can say, forget you both, I'm gone, no more. You guys can deal with it yourself. You can take it with all of them to somebody who can help out the situation. Or you can pick a side. That's probably not a good idea. That causes a lot of divisions and friendships, and it will ch cause big splits. <coughs> the third thing is the Word of God. Word of God. Word. Word. So, you need to learn how to learn it. Learn how to learn it. And there's several ways you can do this. There is a book that's called How to Read Your Bible by K. Arthur, which is pretty cool. Mikey suggested it to me, and that's where we take a lot of our homiletics from. You can also, again, go to Godly Council about those who are further along. You can go to your cell groups. You can come to any of the mentors. Anybody who you know is going to bestow wisdom upon you. So the second thing is you have to learn it. You have to learn the Bible. Seems like a pretty big task, doesn't it? That is a lifetime-long task that every, every one of us should be working on, and it's difficult, guys. <laughs> but it's fun. You discover awesome things about God. You discover awesome things about people, and you can just blow the lid off of any place you go into because you are so filled with the Spirit and the Word. Okay, everybody's kind of fading. So, mm -mm. so the third thing from Word of God is seek truth, not justification. Mm, we do this a lot, don't we? Instead of letting the Bible shape us, we're going to take some parts from the Bible here and then take some parts from what our friend says or what someone on Facebook says and then something we saw on E. What is, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Man versus wild. What is what? What are these things? I don't even know. Just read yeah, books. Okay. So we need to let the word shape us. That's huge. And the last verse I'm going to leave you guys with was something I mentioned earlier. It's John fourteen six through seven. 
This is Jesus talking to his disciples when they're questioning about a bunch of things and there's one no more. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. What's Jesus saying here? Somebody tell me what Jesus is saying here. Know him, you know the Father. Know him, you know God. I discussed earlier that Jesus was the living word. So does that not make also our Bible a living thing? So know the word, know Jesus, know God. We have to hold to that foundation. The pillar that we stand for is built from the truths in the Bible. The Bible is truth. Would you agree with that? Yeah? Awesome. So when you're faced with something that could potentially sway you, and when I'm faced with something that could potentially sway me, I, I have to discern. There's nothing more important than discovering what God has planned and what Satan has planned. If we follow true to what the Bible says, if we follow true to what God in our hearts tells us, then we can overcome that deception. And we have to press for truth in all situations, even the smallest situation. So, you guys following me still? All right. So, so someone tell me big number one. What's big number <laughs> all right so if you guys have something that's just like in your mind is just clicked on about that like oh man what you've been thinking one way and then God just laid on your heart like think about it think about what I would do what I'm trying to tell you and God wants you to go a certain way with your your life and you're trying to go a different way and you don't feel the peace of God in that, be open to the idea that you could be wrong, right? What's big number two? Godly counsel. Seek wisdom from those who have your best interests at heart. Not somebody who's on your same level, like you've got a friend, like, oh, hey, I'm going through that too. Let's, uh, let's, let's deal with it together. That's probably going to, the blind leading the blind. <laughs> Lemmings off a cliff. That's not good. Big number three, <clears throat> word of God. Learn how to learn it. Learn it. Boom. Okay. You guys understanding everything. Awesome. So I'm going to pray over us real quick. God, just thank you for the wisdom and direction that's in your word. Thank you for allowing us to have something that's physical in our hands that we can comprehend that we can understand. And I thank you that we are able to have this direct connection with you through the Bible. And I pray that we are able to help each other to see where we need to go in your will. Allow us to rely on those who are further than us and to recognize them and honor them. God, our, our ultimate goal is to, to be like you and people can't see where we end and you begin. There's just this holy presence that's around us, God. Uh, as we leave from this place, I pray that we dig into our Bible even more. We strive to see you in all things. We recognize that the Bible is the foundation for truth because it is. <laughs> God, I pray that we're able to recognize what is good, what is evil. We can discern and we can allow ourselves to grow from it. And we can also allow ourselves to see when we might be being deceived. God, I pray that there's a blessing on all of us tonight. And uh, our eyes are open and our minds are unclouded about things that are going on in our lives. And you just, you just grow inside of us, God. We open up our hearts to you again. And we ask you to give us direction. I pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Worship team, would y'all come on up? Guys, we're going to play one last song. And uh, during that song, we're going to open up these altars. And I want you to challenge yourself. 
I want you to open up to the thought that maybe, maybe you're wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. I want you to question yourself and make sure that you are not deceived. Because that's the thing about deception, like David said, is if you're deceived, you don't realize it. And too often we think, oh, I'm not deceived. Yeah, I'm good. But do you ever ask yourself that? Do you ever pray about it? Do you ever ask God, maybe, maybe I'm not going down this path that I'm supposed to be going on? And so, if God's working in your heart, I want to invite you to come down to this altar when we start this song up. Maybe that's you that's, you're going down this path and you were praying to God and you were looking for an answer and an answer didn't come so you just kind of jumped to a conclusion and you assumed that this was the direction you were supposed to go and now you're praying about it and you're like, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe this wasn't the path that God had for me. Maybe God's saying, hey, I didn't tell you to go that way. I didn't answer you because I wanted you to wait here. I didn't want you to go down that path. Maybe God is saying, if you would just be patient right here, I'm going to tell you which way to go. But your ways are not my ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. And so maybe you've taken things into your own hands and you've even deceived yourself. Or maybe you've been hearing some teachings that have made you start thinking different things about God and the Bible and truth. If that's you, man, I want to invite you to come down to this altar and pray it through. Pray it through. So if you guys would stand with me. And as we sing this song, like I said, I, I just want to open up these altars. And if God is working on your heart, man, this is a hard, hard lesson to question if I'm deceived. I want every person in here to think that and pray that. There's some of you that aren't deceived. That's great. I hope that no one is, but you might be. But you've got to be open to that idea. You've got to pray through stuff like this. So we're just going to go through this song.
You are our foundation. Yes. moved to say this um, you know some of you guys might leave this place being scared oh man I'm all I might be deceived I might be deceived you know and, and the point of this is not to be afraid of being deceived the point of this is is to warn us that it can happen to anybody again it says the spirit clearly says that in the latter times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits why would they do that they would only do that if it was tempting or if it seemed like it was the right thing to do and they'll follow these deceiving spirits. And it says that many will have, in, in the next book, uh, Second Timothy, it says, you will have itching ears seeking, heaping teachers just to tell them what they want to hear. And, and if you think about it, like, just close your eyes, you know? Like, you know, we rely on our senses a lot to, to find truth. And, uh, you know, what we see, what we hear, what we feel, you know? And say you're out in a boat in the middle of nowhere, you know, and, you know, you fill that boat with your hand. You know, you, well, at least you know you're there. You, you exist. And, and then you feel the rock and you can kind of tell that you're in water or something. How do you know where to go from there? You know, well, you got to open your eyes. You got to listen. You got to use your senses. And what David was telling us tonight is basically the word of God is that foundation. It's that fixed point of reference, what Reagan was talking about. That one thing that we can count on that every time we go back to, if we ever get lost, it is our compass. And not just when we get lost, but in any which way we need to go. It'll guide us. It'll direct us. And yet, so many of us guys, we get our doctrine, we get our, our, our beliefs that determine our behaviors, again, and our values, and how we think the world should go. We get it from, from other places beside the word. And I really want you to think about this. You know, what have I let get up into me? You know? What have I allowed, like, maybe the media to tell me what to think? And I've kind of made my whole worldview around what they say. Well, I got to thinking about this the other day. My brother used to work for MSNBC, and uh, he was a cameraman. He was just got so, you know, mad. He was like, I don't understand, you know. They just throw things out, and they don't tell the right stories and stuff like that, and they kind of twist the truth, you know. But, you know, us who watch it, we don't know that. We just, all we know about what's going on in Sudan, I mean, have, has anybody been, been to Sudan? Anybody? No? I haven't been to Sudan. So the only thing I know about Sudan is what people tell me about Sudan, Right? So that's what he was talking about, too, about the single story. If, if you hear this story, you're going to believe it, right? Because that's what someone told you about it. And that's why, you know, everything that we get about what we believe and, and where we go and what we believe about this or that, going into politics, going into, um, I don't know, media, what, whatever it may be, you know, what do we believe? We need to really base everything off the Word of God because it would be so easy to be deceived. Amen. Let me just share one lie with you. I was um, asked to be on this panel last week. Um, they were showing this movie, and it was dealing with Christianity and homosexuality. And, um, and the movie was that there was a pastor and his brother, and the brother brought his, his boyfriend on this vacation. And uh, it was a crazy night because we watched this whole movie. And... Um, and I was the only pastoral person that was on the, on the board. There was like me, and then there was other guys, you know, there's three other people. One of them was the actor in the movie. And um, 
And I wrestled all day long with trying to figure out what I was going to tell these people because it was Q&A. And they said, Mikey, what do you think you know, about, about this movie? You're like, how do, how do you take this movie from a Christian standpoint? And it, it was a loaded question because they kind of stacked it against the Christians, you know. It was kind of like the Pharisees uh, where they would try to trick Jesus, you know. If he said this, he would be wrong. And if he said this, he would be wrong. And either way, you know, God, it was kind of cool because God gave me the words to speak in that moment. But um, the lie was this. You know, a lot of people believe, or, or they use this as an excuse. They say, well, Jesus went and he ate with sinners and he hung out with prostitutes and he, he did all this kind of stuff. So I'm good. Right? And, and that's only half the story. Because what, and, and this is what I told them. I said, well, well, here's the thing. God does not hate sinners. He, he, we're all sinners and there's not one sin that's bigger than another. But here's the thing. When Jesus went in, he, he went in and he touched these people that no one else would touch, lepers and, 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 and other things according to Le Levitical law that he should have never done, but he did it anyway. He reached in after them and he touched them and he hung out with these sinners and did all this kind of stuff. But then what did he do? It doesn't end there. He healed their sickness for one. He forgave their sins, but to forgive their sin, they had to admit that there was a sin there, right? We have to admit that we're sinners. And then what did he do? In most cases, he said, go and sin no more. So where people will put into their doctrine, oh, this, oh, and then they'll just leave it. We have to remember the full story. We have to let the word of God fully direct our path. Amen. And so um, through all of that, we must always, like, like you said, learn how to learn it and learn it and read it constantly, you know, and, and always be, you know, even me as a preacher, I'm always asking myself, okay, let me make, you know, I got to test this out because if I ever get solid, like, you know, if I ever get um, just like a solid thing, then I'll become brittle. It reminds me of the, the Hoover Dam. Anybody know about the Hoover Dam? The outside is, is, you know, it's all concrete, but the outside is, is firm and set concrete, but they actually have water lines running through the middle of it to keep the concrete wet, because if it ever dried out, it'd become brittle and it would break. And so there are things in the scriptures, things that are un you know, you, you cannot change. I mean, things that, that, that sh should never, they're unnegotiables. Jesus is the only way to heaven. There's no other way, guys. And if anybody tries to tell you that, that's a, that's a lie. It's a deception. There's no other way to heaven, okay? Um, you know, Jesus is the only way. The word of God is the inerrant, you know, infallible word that we can trust. It is God's word straight to us. He protected this so that we can read it and we can believe every word of it. That's another one. Uh, but then there's other things like, should you, should you dunk to get baptized or should you get sprinkled? You know, who cares? You know, these are little things, you know, that churches divide on is dumb, you know, and they'll get so hardcore, well, I'm right and I'm right. And it's like, you know, you know, there's some things that are, that are, that, that don't matter so much. You know what I mean? So, so make sure you got the non-negotiables down, you know? And, and then, then start digging and pressing for truth on the other matters. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, you are our hope. We will not walk tim timidly uh, because you said God has not given you a spirit of timidity or fear. We don't have to walk around being afraid that we are deceived on this or that or whatever on little issues, big issues. We don't have to walk around in fear but Lord God that we need to take note of ourselves that we need to um, seek our soul or, 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 or look deep into our soul and say like David is search me O God and know my heart see if, if there be any wicked way in me which is to say Lord I'm open to the idea that I am wrong on this little issue on this fight that I'm having with my parents on this fight that I'm having with my roommate, on the direction that I'm going in my life, you know, on uh, the, the, the girl that I'm supposed to marry or whatever it may be, Lord, I'm going to lay myself like the Hoover Dam. I'm going to let that be in your hands, fluid, and you can steer me in that direction, Lord God. I pray right now, Father, that... Uh, your spirit that we trust it. it says in John 16 13 that when the spirit of truth comes that he will guide us into all truth 
that we, we will, that your spirit will guide us into truth. We will be discerning. We will know the truth. And then we're going to bounce it off of the, the wisdom of elders, as it says, Father God, that there's wisdom in the council of elders. We're going to just know your word deep. In the name of Jesus, I pray, Father God, wisdom. I pray discernment. I pray, Lord God, that we would just look through. You know, see if there be any wicked way in us. See if there be anything that we believe that was a lie. And, and why is it important to uproot that? Because our belief determines our behavior. Determines where we go and what we do. I just praise your name for it, Lord. Would you guide us, direct us, Lord. Thank you for this word tonight. And uh, Lord, just bless us as we go from this place. In your precious name. Amen. Okay. Um, the people that are going to do the bridge uh, need to meet up in the fusion room right now. We're not even going to stand around to talk for like two seconds. So go ahead and go ahead and make your way on out. Um, and, and anybody else on the leadership team that wants to help out uh, that could go out tomorrow night and talk to some youth groups, please meet up in the, in the fusion room right now. Second thing, uh, make sure to sign up for uh, the uh, lip sync. Uh, make sure to go and, and sign up for a shack tomorrow in the JBK. And what was the rest of it? What was the rest of it? Oozfest, if anybody wants to do that. And that was it. Oh, leadership interviews. Yes. Pick up a, a, a um, leadership application and, do, uh, and sign up for a leadership app or interview on the window upstairs. God bless you guys. We'll see you at Wendy's or at uh, Ultimate Frisbee.